I'd love to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Rishikesh B.S. He's a professor at Azim Premji University, and he currently leads the hub for education, law, and policy at Azim Premji University. His main research interests have been education policies, assessment, and teacher education. And he's done many, many different projects and roles over more than two decades. Uh, and of late, past couple of years, education policy has been like the core of his work. And he's a government, he's on many government advisory committees on a lot of issues concerning education, particularly in his uh, domicile state, which is Karnataka. Um, so welcome, Rishikesh, really excited to learn from you and hear what you have to share. And would love maybe if you can get us started with uh, this whole idea of reimagining curriculum and going beyond the basics. And according to you, why is that so relevant today? Thank you so much, uh, Venil, uh, for that introduction and uh, both Mahima and you for having me on this panel. Uh, so let's begin uh, with, you know, uh, with, with this whole idea of reconfigured curriculum. Uh, for me, it's, it's all based on uh, the evidence that we have from the ground, right? Um, after two years of uh, what we've seen uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we really have to go back to uh, try and find out as to what really is the situation on ground and what all studies are saying is that students have lost a lot of uh, basic abilities, uh, grade level competencies. In fact, uh, a study that we did almost a year ago at the Azim Premji Foundation uh, indicated that uh, almost 92% of children in classes 3 to 8 have lost at least one foundational ability in mathematics and one in language. Now, uh, what does it mean? It basically means that when a certain foundational ability is lost, you can't build on uh, your learning as you go through your grade. So basically you stop learning. Uh, depending upon the foundational ability that is lost, that particular concept can never be learned, right? It's like, for instance, a child has forgotten units tens and hundreds, it's forgotten the place value. Uh, you can't do any kind of carryover uh, tasks with the child. The child will not be able to do it at all, will not be able to understand at all. So when foundational aspects are lost and uh, evidence says that it's happened across the grades, uh, which again proves that online learning has been very suboptimal and it just can't replace the in-person classrooms. And so when this has happened, you have to reimagine the curriculum. There's just no other way because if we go in with our usual curriculum, what we are going to see is that one, children are going to drop out because they just can't make sense of what's happening. And two, there could be some children who will just struggle and be in school, but at the end of it uh, would have really learned uh, nothing much, right? So that's really the situation. And uh, in, in this case, NEP comes in very handy because the national education policy also talks about reducing the curriculum to the core essentials. Now, here is an opportunity for us where we can implement NEP also because we ought to implement it. You can't go in with the regular curriculum. So the way to reconfigure it is to look at as to what are the core essentials and use the rest of the time to build on foundational abilities, foundational literacy, foundation numeracy concepts for most of the grades and for the very early grades, even pre-literacy and pre-numeracy concepts because many of these children have not even been to pre-primary. So that's really what the situation is on ground, uh, Venil. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's just so stark, the kind of loss that's happened across grades, like you mentioned. Um, so what, according to you, when you said core elements and then obviously the foundational pieces of literacy and numeracy, uh, what are those core essentials? What elements need to be added, modified, reduced, integrated, uh, according to you, so that while we're obviously building all the foundational academic skills, it's also a really thriving and learning environment for students. Yeah, see, I think that's something that educationists will have to get together to decide, depending upon, you know, what is the curricular framework under which they are. Uh, we, of course, have the National Curricular Framework 2005, which is the guiding framework for all the state curricular frameworks that exist. But, uh, you know, within that, the ICSE curriculum, CBSE curriculum, the state board curriculum, 
Um, so across these curricula, what is it that you take as core essentials is something that is useful to come out with the discussion. Um, though there are almost 90% of it, which is going to be common, but the discussion would also enable a kind of uh, collaborative effort. So that discussion is very important. And we need to keep it simple. See, uh, focusing on critical things regarding education, uh, which is usually forgotten uh, in the way we do education, is what really we need to focus on. Um, you can ask two questions there, uh, one at a macro level and one at a micro level. The macro level question is, uh, what are the aims of education, right? What are we, why are we doing what we are doing as part of school education? So ask that big question and then figure out as to, okay, hence, you know, what really should be my focus? And then the next micro level question, which is going to help us to identify those core competencies is what are the learning objectives of whatever I'm teaching? I mean, it could be a subject, it could be a topic within the subject, what are the learning objectives? Because that is going to tell me as to, you know, uh, what I'm engaging in, what is it that I'm going to expect from the children with whom I'm engaging that on uh, at the end of my session or the end of the semester. So these two questions need to be asked by each educator, right? Each teacher with every single concept. And that would help us go to the core essentials. The other, uh, you know, let's say a tip or a guideline is that every subject has a certain nature, to it, right? So that is, that's the nature of each subject that is there in uh, all the curricula. And uh, so we need to figure out, we need to understand as to what is the nature of the subject, which will help us arrive at the uh, core essentials uh, into which we have to get. Uh, otherwise, if we go in with the regular syllabus, uh, with tens of chapters and unnecessarily content heavy kind of a system that we have, um, we are going to get into huge trouble. And it's unfortunate to see that there is not much of thinking happening uh, everywhere on this. They all plan to start off the usual academic year thinking that maybe a month, two months bridge course will bring all children up to speed. Um, what we should remember is a bridge course is fine after a two months summer vacation. But we try doing a bridge course after a two year almost vacation, which you know, was not a very happy one. So hence you can't call it a vacation, but a two year hiatus and then thinking of a two month bridge is, um, you know, very clearly not knowing what is the reality on ground. Yeah, absolutely. I Thank you for those guiding questions. I think at whatever level of educators, whether they're doing it for their classroom or school or at an education policy, I think those are useful anchors to design that. And I think I'd love to understand, obviously there are many sessions today talking about SEL and social emotional learning. Um, and if you've seen examples already of some states or districts trying to integrate more of those elements into the core curriculum, because of course there has to be a big focus on bridging the gap and uh, the learning loss that has happened on foundational elements, but the child is a whole child. And like you said, these two years have just not been easy for anyone and least for children, right? All the social, the activity, the playing, everything's taken away. So what is the importance according to you that's gonna play and how best does it fit into the curriculum? It's, it's a very, very crucial element of schooling. And uh, that is the reason why the online, whatever experiment was tried just fell flat. Because uh, education, as you know, each one of us understands, it's a very, very human social process. Now, that has gone missing uh, from children over the last two years. So whatever we do uh, in education, when children have come back now, uh, even within each of that, for instance, we are distilling uh, the curriculum into the core essentials, right? Now, within that core essential will have to be embedded SEL competencies because that is the way we learn and uh, having uh, you know these socio emotional aspects in place is very crucial for any kind of learning to take place so you know that's the reason why i uh, didn't even bring it in because it's just you know uh, such a matter of fact thing that uh, you know it, it has to be there but we have to reiterate because as i said uh, we've been doing education even without thinking of what the aims of education are now when you start asking this question as to what aims of education 
are and uh, you know putting it down then socio emotional learning is going to be all over you know every single aim that we put down there and uh, so it's a it's a focus that is not something that you do specially or separately but it's a focus that will have to happen in everything that we do in fact just yesterday i was uh, reading this piece in the guardian uh, in uk the ofsted has uh, uh, come up with a study on the kind of uh, gaps that have uh, occurred in in children's life in uk due to the lockdown and they did not even have the kind of lockdown that our children had right almost a continuous two years uh, but then uh, completely missing on simple uh, behavioral aspects i mean there was uh, this particular phrase which really caught my attention wherein they are seeing first graders crawl from the classroom to the toilet rather than walk so you know being at home they are just crawling around they have not even, even they are just not even in the habit of walking short distances they are crawling so it's there in that report in the ofsted report and uh, you know uh, so these are i mean this is just to kind of say as to what are the different ways in which this uh, uh, school closure has uh, impacted children now for for us in our country it's uh, slightly different uh, given that though the schools were closed pretty much you know everything else was open except for those curfew days uh, so children were all around playing interacting so they did not miss out as much socially particularly in our rural areas you know all the children who would go to the village school were all there always playing around so it was really ridiculous for us to have kept the schools closed because they were all together uh, maybe it seemed like we were protecting you know the adults who would otherwise engage with the children um, so that way socially uh, engaging with the peers most of our rural children did not miss out our urban middle class children did miss out so that's an issue that has to be tackled in the schools into which our middle class goes to uh, but in the rural schools there were other issues that came up uh, adolescent girls were being married off right uh, adolescent boys were being sent off to work now getting all of them back these children back into school because they're all in the cusp of elementary secondary and uh, you know moment you go to secondary uh, people would say no detention and uh, because they have not learned now you fail them in grade 9 uh, it's going to be a disaster uh because obviously i mean a child you are attracting the child back into school because uh you know the schools have opened and then in school you fail the child saying that the child has not learned because you didn't have school for two years i mean it can't be more unjust and uh, so we need to really think about what is it that we have education for uh is it those board exams uh, that we are bothered about or is it learning that we are bothered about yeah great point um and i think that the last part especially on the board exams and feeling like a student in 9th or 10th because they just miss schooling like assessments is such a core piece that drives curriculum drives or even whatever the curriculum is what gets prioritized and deprioritized highly gets driven by what's in the assessment so what changes do you think are important to bring into how we assess uh students at all grades not just at the board exam to really truly be able to cater to what they really need uh see my suggestion is uh, get rid of the board exams right but of course things won't don't happen that way um it's it's not easy and it's not an overnight thing but it has to happen at least the kind of board exams that we have to improve our education system it has to be thrown out of the window um now but getting rid of something like that need not be a violent exercise uh it can be made redundant right by ensuring that the focus of our assessment is what happens as class as classroom assessment cbas classroom based assessments teacher led assessments give prominence and emphasize on these kinds of assessments uh, even if there has to be a summative assessment a school based summative assessment right uh, where you also provide the agency to the stakeholders in the immediate teaching learning environment provide the teachers with the agency and say that assessment is for you and one need not fear about these assessments it's for you to figure out as to where your children are so that you know you chart the uh, road ahead and so once that autonomy is provided to the teacher with the trust the teachers are going to come out and one need not really bother about doing these uh, 
assessments externally, right? External assessments can happen like the ASAL, like the NAS or anything else, which can, you know, give us the health of the system. But otherwise it should be, the focus should really be on the internal assessments. Uh, so when this strengthens, the board exams would become redundant. Of course, it will require a couple of other things. For instance, as we strengthen these classroom-based assessments, in-school assessments, we need to strengthen assessments such as the portfolio assessments, right? Project-based assessments. Now, these uh, have to be strengthened as part of this overall rejig or assessment reform, as we would like to call it. Um, along with this, of course, it will also have to go hand in hand with reforms in higher education. And that is why this is not going to happen overnight. Right? Uh, once at the university level, we stop asking for these great 12 marks cards, uh, things are going to change. Uh, if I start asking for your portfolio, right? Uh, obviously, then the focus is going to be as to what am I going to do over the next four years so that at the end of my high school, 9, 10, 11, 12, I need to have a good enough portfolio for my university entrance. Now, so that change in terms of higher education entrance is what is required and it is on its way through NEP. Um, one of the things that has started this year is the common entrance. Of course, there will have to be further refinement of it. Uh, but then uh, we are on that direction. One of the reasons why also the national education policy talks about school education reform and higher education reform together. You can't get one done without the other. Right. So these changes, uh, which are beyond the purview of school education, will also have to happen for these assessment changes to take place. But as those of us engaged in school education, I think uh, by emphasizing uh, the good assessments, such as you know portfolios, uh, emphasizing on approaches which are you know uh, based on project projects, project-based learning is the approach. Now these naturally then would align us to also the kind of changes we would like to see in the assessments. And that is really what is going to help us uh, make this uh, shift as well. And uh, you know that is when we would be able to do all the things that we would like to. Otherwise, as you rightly said, I mean, assessment at, you know, at the end of this entire spectrum, uh, standing there as almost that you know, gate, you all, we all are going to make ourselves uh, into those uh, whatever characters who will pass through that gate, right? Uh, so whatever we do, finally, it's about that character which will have to pass through get that gate. So yeah, I think there is quite a bit of work uh, required on that. But then uh, you know, many of us are doing uh, uh, many things, which is slowly taking us there. I think it's just that there will have to be a lot more people joining uh, everyone else who's uh, moving in that direction so that we can move in the direction quicker and it's at the end of the day for the good of everyone it's uh, for the good of the, ch the children who are there in school it would be good of the society later on because the kind of children who will then come out uh, would be far better equipped to handle the problems our society faces so it's finally for the good of everyone but I uh, hope we all realize it uh, soon and make, make that pace a little faster absolutely yeah i think right up in higher education like the nep says i think the change needs to trickle down but also start bottom up like you said through teacher autonomy uh an agency to own those assessments i have one big um question which is on my mind given the mammoth kind of changes needed right really looking at uh making the curriculum work for where students are at right now reducing it but not um you know trivializing the really core aims of education and just making it very like core academics and then like you said the sel components need to just be in every single uh, interaction and class so almost the pedagogy itself of how you would lead a class needs to evolve um and finally the assessments right that's a lot of change that we're hoping to make or we feel that is needed to make and the uh, the new academic year is creeping up on us. So from an education policy level or even for like a school leader, what would you recommend as how to approach this so that we're ready in time and not feeling overwhelmed with the amount of changes that need to happen and which then inhibits us from getting started with something basic as well? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Venil. I think, you know, this is, uh, this is something that we all should have been thinking about across the country, in fact, across the world, uh, about one and a half years ago, 
right? We lost the last year when schools did open up a little bit because that is when we should have brought in all these changes. Uh, and for us, NEP was already there and we should have just used that opportunity and uh, gone into this mode. But, um, you know, better late than never. Um, and there are states which have uh, already started working towards that. Um, I'm happy to say Karnataka is one of them. Uh, wherein uh, there is a completely reconfigured curriculum that has been worked upon over the last three months. And all the diets have been engaged in this work, wherein they looked at each subject um, and identified the core competencies based on the learning outcomes that NCRD had put out. And uh, so they have taken out the core competencies. They have created learning uh, sheets. I mean, they don't like to call it the worksheets. They're calling it the learning sheets saying that, uh, you know, this is not something that children are made to work on and then ticked and filed, but then this is the sheet through which they're going to learn. And then they have a teacher handbook created for each of the subjects. So the teacher is going to use the teacher uh, handbook, use these learning sheets with the children, use those learning sheets itself as an assessment aspect. You know, those some of those learning sheets would go into the portfolio, uh, some of them for an assessment for the teacher. And then wherever required, they will bring in some aspects from the textbook. So the textbook is also going to be there. There are some children, for instance, uh, you know, who are who would be ahead uh, for whatever advantages that they have at home. Um, they would probably be almost at the grade appropriate level. And uh, so for them, along with these learning sheets, the chapters in the textbook would be the additional material that they're going to engage in. So this is this is the way uh, that the next year or two will have to be looked at uh, so that all children in the next year or two at best would be more or less in, you know, in the grade appropriate level so that then the teacher can uh, teach the way she used to earlier. But the next one or two years is going to be very different and uh, one will have to be mindful of that. It's not that we've never had heterogeneous uh, you know, classrooms where learners are spread across the spectrum, but then they were spread across this narrower you know, band. Currently, the spread is a very large band. Uh, if we have one minute, I'm just going to quickly take that minute uh, to share with you an example of one experiment which uh, I did uh, in grade eight, wherein children were given grade six questions of mathematics, 15 questions, and they all did it. And then very quickly I asked them how they did it. And they were very happy and they said uh, they've done it very well. And I asked how many of them think that all the 15 they've got right. Uh, out of 40 students, uh, you know, almost uh, 25 raised their hands. And then uh, it was eight standard. And I said, okay, uh, so which means how many, what percentage of you do you think will get 10% here? And I got those of them who thought they're going to get 15 to come on the board and work out a percentage, you know, 25 out of 40. They couldn't get it. So, uh, so they think that they know and they are very confident and that's, you know, the optimism is very nice. But what we need to understand is in that group, there were children who were struggling to have foundational literacy and numeracy tasks completed in that paper. And, and there, was, there were two children who got 14 out of 15, right? which shows that they're almost there, but it was a grade six paper. So, so this is the spread and we need to be ready for this. Thank you so much. I think a lot of small and big nuggets throughout. Hopefully that gives everyone listening some tools and guiding questions that they can take back because I think we definitely all need all the help that we can and I think it's the best moment for us to also just leverage this community of educa educators much more so that it becomes easier to make these changes and we can learn faster from each other. So thank you so much for sharing all your insights and wisdom. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for having me.